Great to have everyone here. Um, I'm pretty interactive as a as a presenter, so if you guys just sit there dumb, uh, <laughs> it's going to be really boring for everyone. So just bear that in mind as we go through here. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, cement con and concrete for the most part. But what I actually first want to talk about is glue. So uh, this. <laughs> you gotta love work computers that have crap on them that you have absolutely no control over. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna talk about glue. We're gonna start talking about glue. So obviously, there's lots of different types of glue. There's the regular wood glue, there's Gorilla Glue, there's different formats of glue, there's the glue gun, there's Yoohoo stick glue. If you've got kids, you probably want to be using this glue. Sometimes your kids want to get fancy and have glow in the dark glue. If you've got girls, they'll want this glue, for sure. But the question is, how do you actually figure out what sort of glue you're actually wanting to use? Well, when it comes to glues in the industrial sense, we think of glues more in, with a different name. We either call them adhesives or binders, okay? So let's have a look at four different glues. Uh, and these are actually, these are published um, LCA results in, in published EPDs uh, for different, uh, different types of glues uh, and different uh, LCI impacts. So we have global warming potential on the left, we have acidification, eutrophication, and smog generation potential. Now glue number one is a petrochemical uh, basis. These two are uh, manufactured minerals, and then this final one is a refined oil. So based on, because we're all here and focused on embodied carbon and all of those sort of nice things and familiar with EPDs and how they work and stuff like that, of these glues, which so which are the glues that you would be most interested in using? Oh. This is the interactive part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. None of them? None of them? <laughs> well, what do you use glue for? Everything. <laughs> when you've got glue, what are you, what are you using <laughs> glue for? Making Making sticking stuff back together. <laughs> So all of those things that are separate, you want to stick them together. So we use glues in a number of different ways in buildings. So all of these glues are used in buildings. So which of these glues do you think we should be focusing on in terms of using more or less of? Which are the glues that you want to stick, stay away from? from a, particularly as we're focused on embodied carbon here, for example. Top, maybe like three or four. You like three and four? You don't, nobody want, who wants to use number one? Seems bad. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <Yeah. laughs> it's a trick question. No, we're struggling to understand what the numbers really mean. These are, these numbers are well, we'll just different them. glues. Um, I'll reveal yeah, but, what these glues what actually is, are. What does point zero one two mean on like, so this, is, so, this is the LCI, so this is the LCI, so these are the different LCI impact categories. Okay. And these are the impact, the kg impact per kg of glue that's used. Okay. And GWP okay. is embodied carbon. Yeah, so this Global is your carbon. Carbon. This is yeah. your carbon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's really hard to comment because uh, how do you know how much of the, what kind of properties does this glue have? How much of number one do I need? For the same application as I could use number four? Yeah. yeah. Good point. <laughs> and it depends, it, the, each of these glues are completely different glues, and it depends. That's one of the factors that you need to consider is how much of these glues do you actually need to do the thing that you want the glue to do? Okay, so it's not as simple as just looking at these global warming potentials, for example, and saying, that's the glue that I want to use, because you, as you have rightly pointed out, you've got to figure out how much of that glue you actually need. So in terms of what these glues are, so these glues, this top one is a solvent-free adhesive. This is uh, actually SMP, which is a, um, a glue that is used for um, 
glue lamb and CLT and uh, plywoods and all of those sorts of things to glue those pieces of wood together. So that's typically the glue that's used for, for those. The next one, uh, number two, was actually GU cement uh, and then GUL cement. Now, the difference between GU and GUL, I mean, I'll get onto this a little bit later, but GU is, these are CSA standard definitions or uh, codes for what these different cements are. So GU is a general use cement and a GUL is a general use for limestone cement. And then the bottom one here is an asphalt blender. So it's actually pretty good as far as global warming potential goes, but use in a building, you're looking at things like asphalt shingles and things like that, but to actually glue stuff back together to build buildings, not <laughs> so useful. So it's not, not only how much of the glue you actually use, but uh, how the glue is used and how effective that glue is as well. So given that uh, if you're looking at uh, uh, comparing cement to say uh, the solvent pre-adhesive that's used for, uh, for wood products like glue lamb and CLTs, the cement doesn't actually look that bad as far as global warming potential. So the question is, why does the industry have a hate on for cement and concrete and let's build everything out of something other than concrete? Well, let's look at the history of cement production and use of concrete. So where does this timeline start? If we're looking at the history of, uh, of concrete. Romans. 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 Yeah, I'm not going to go quite that far back. <laughs> <laughs> it's an, it's an itty bitty line. That's way. That's like way over there. Somewhere. I'm not going to go quite that far back. So um, I'm actually going to start with uh, with this guy. Anyone recognize this guy? No. No. As we go through here, you know, there may be some more things that become more familiar with to you as, uh, as we go along here. So this is actually 1824. So this guy is uh, Joseph Aspton. He is a uh, English mason who has basically patented or patented, depending on where you come from, um, the cement manufacturing process. The, 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 so that is the cement that we use today, the hydraulic cement that we use today. So that was... Uh, Invented and in, basically invented in 1824. So then we're going to start looking at some different structures and things like that. So anyone recognize this bridge? It's actually a bridge. Still in place now, actually. Any guesses? Any guesses as to a year? 1825? <laughs> <laughs> no. The year is actually 1889. So this bridge is called the uh, Alvord Lake Bridge, which is in uh, San Francisco. Built in uh, 1889. As nobody recognized what this bridge was, you probably don't know why this bridge is significant. This is actually the first uh, structure that used reinforced concrete in its construction. So this, so the guy that actually um, worked on this was a, a gentleman called um, Ernest Ransom. Uh, people thought he was absolutely nuts at the time. Uh, he built this bridge. He was the first one to actually use square twisted steel incorporated in the concrete to basically come up with the first reinforced concrete structure. So 1889. So big gap there. What about this building? Anyone recognize this building? Chicago Tribune, no. This building is actually the uh, Ingalls Center. Okay. Anyone know why that's significant? <laughs> this is actually the uh, the first high rise in uh, in the U.S. Uh, to incorporate um, reinforced concrete in its construction. Okay. Any guesses as to what? Well, actually, before I get onto this, anyone any fans here of uh, ninety nine percent invisible? Yeah. Yeah. Guess what? There's a plaque. <laughs> Not a very interesting plaque, but there is a plaque. <laughs> so any uh, guesses as to when this was erected? 1903. 1903. <laughs> you are paying attention. <laughs> what about this one? This structure. Any guesses? Now we're starting to get into things that you should 
start to recognize a lot, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Sorry? Panama Canal. Any, any uh, guesses as to construction date? 1912. 1912, you're pretty good. 1914, completed in 1914, started in about 1880 something or other. Long time for construction, quite a, uh, uh, a tortuous uh, route to actually being finished. So right about this time, there were also some architects that got involved in, in concrete construction, and some of those are rather prominent architects. Anyone recognize this building? Right. Frank Lloyd Wright, <laughs> Falling Water. So this was actually uh, not his first building that he built in reinforced concrete. One of his earlier buildings is actually the Unity Church, which was done in 19, uh, 1904. I think it was and that's actually a, a heritage listed building as well as is falling water yeah. uh, and is going about to be going for the working through a uh, reconstruction and rehabilitation project at the moment okay. yeah so um, so falling water any ideas construction date uh, Nin we're in the 19 somethings 1945? 1935. And now we're really going to start getting into structures that you can recognize. Hoover Dam. Any ideas? 1971. That's a big, that's a big stretch. 1935, actually. So some of these structures have been around for a long time already. And not only is, is concrete being used for, uh, for construction of things like locks and dams and buildings, um, churches, uh, they're also used for things like the Sydney Opera House. Any ideas on the, the date for that one? 71? <laughs> <laughs> I should have bought some prize, some prizes. Yeah. <laughs> Petronas Towers. Any ideas? 84. 1996. France. Milau Viaduct. Tallest, tallest uh, currently, uh, still. The, uh, the tallest bridge in the world. 2001 or 2002? 2001 or 2? Pretty good. 2004? You guys are getting pretty good at this one. It's getting closer to living memory, at least, I guess. Okay, this one. Another bridge. Sorry? Hoover Dam, close to Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam Bypass, yep. Any ideas? 2014? Any other takers? 2009. 2009. Okay. Who said that? Wow. Oh. And now we get really good. Dubai. The Burj Khalifa, Khalifa, Dubai. Any ideas when it was uh, finished? 2015. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was more. Re I thought it was more recent. What it actually is as well. It's 2010. Oh, yeah. Surprising, it's been around for that long already. <laughs> now, yeah. sorry. It hasn't been topped yet. No. Now, I wouldn't expect anyone to really recognize this one. You saying? Uh, actually, Katrina. Right. <laughs> we should. Be, yeah. Sorry. I said we right over. Yeah. Yeah, we have one person in the audience that even recognizes the building to begin with. Um, the reason that this building is important, obviously we've got a lot of uh, big structural things uh, leading up until this point, but this building is important because it utilizes uh, ultra high performance concrete and this lattice work around the outside of the building is actually entirely made of concrete. Built in 2013. So if we actually put all of this stuff on the timeline, if we start over here at 1824, which is actually a little bit off the screen over there, 1889 is, is quite a jump already. And between 1824 and, and 1889, the industry was really in its infancy, obviously. And a lot of people were looking at cement and basically saying, this is a highly specialized 
product, it's going to have a very limited use, it's really not going anywhere as far as uh, a major construction product goes. 1889 changed all that with uh, Ernest Ransom, and actually it was Ernest Ransom that uh, designed the uh, Englewood building as well in 1903. When my 19, 1914 label go? Well, imagine there's a line in here as well. <laughs> 1973, 1996, 2004, 2010, and 2013, which is way over here. So if you actually look at this timeline, not only is it all over here, and we've been using more and more cement and concrete in, in all of these buildings, but these buildings are getting pretty damn big. So that's why the cement industry and the ready mix and the concrete industry is such a focus when it comes to reducing embodied carbon. It's not so much that there's a lot of embodied carbon in the product itself, it's we use so damn much of it, okay? Concrete is the second most consumed product in the world behind what? Water. 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 Behind water. That's how much we use of the stuff worldwide. To give you an idea, this is one of the, the uh, Consumption of, uh, of cement uh, worldwide looks like since 1990. So we started back in 1990 uh, over here with about 1.15 billion tons of cement consumed worldwide. Peak demand uh, over here in about 2015, 16, 17, uh, around that area at a little under uh, well, 4.15 billion tons of cement worldwide so yes it is a significant product that's used worldwide and that is why there is such a focus on embodied carbon with cement so how is cement made this is a basic overview of the cement manufacturing process just to give you a, a, a over over broad a broad idea about how it's made so we start off with our We're not there yet. <laughs> well, that's not going to work. So we start off with our, uh, our raw materials up here. What we do is we grind those up into a fine powder. We heat them up to 1450 or somewhere between 1450 and 1500 degrees Celsius. So it gets pretty damn hot. Uh, we actually make a, a, an intermediate product at this point. Uh, we cool that down rapidly. We add gypsum to that, which is, is used to help control the setting of the cement. We grind it up into a fine powder again, and then we have cement. So if you add all of this stuff up the top here, we actually start off with, with one kilo of material, but we're making 690 grams of cement at the bottom, even though we've got another 50 grams of material that's added <coughs> at this point. So where did the extra weight go? CO2. CO2. So why does the cement industry produce all this CO2? Any ideas? Calcium carbonate reduction. Yeah, calcium carbonate reduction. So limestone is predominantly calcium carbonate. The first step that is undertaken in the heating process is to actually reduce that calcium carbonate, drive off the CO2 from the calcium carbonate to make calcium oxide. That is then chemically bound with other materials like the silica, the alumina, and the iron to make calcium silicates, which is the glue that binds all these rocks back together. And effectively, what we're, what we're really doing with concrete and why concrete is such a significant building material is that we're taking rocks that, in some cases, are taken out of a, uh, out of a quarry as whole rocks and broken down into the small rocks being crushed aggregate. The idea of cement is to actually just glue all of that back together. And the reason that we want to do that is because cement, well concrete, sorry, can be delivered to a building site in a plastic state, put into a form and made into whatever shape you want, which is a lot more efficient in terms of, a, in terms of 
building and creating a structure in comparison to how it was done before, taking that rock out of the, out of the hillside or out of a quarry as one big lump and then refining that down to the shape that you want. Okay, so that's part of the reason why, why concrete has become as significant as it has. So we heat this, uh, heat this material up, drive off the CO2, so that's one part of the CO2. And the other part of the CO2 is we use, we're using a lot of fuel to heat these materials up to these sort of temperatures. Okay, so the two main uh, emissions that come out of cement manufacturing, one from the fuel, and one from the calcination or decarbonation reaction, which is driving CO2 off from calcium carbonate to make calcium oxide. It's worked before. And we don't get the point. <laughs> this is just, just an introduction at the moment. Yeah. I've seen this a few times. <laughs> okay, so basically uh, we receive, and, and this uh, has Lafarge all over it, but I'm not advertising Lafarge here at all, I'm representing the industry, so don't shoot me for that. So we, so we, uh, so we take limestone, we receive limestone uh, at the cement plant, and this is a fairly generic uh, process that's used uh, throughout the world. So we take the limestone, we receive the limestone, uh, put that in piles, and these are called pre-homogenization piles to try and even out the chemistry that we have with the limestone. Because we are creating chemistry here um, in, in terms of the reactions that, we're, that are done inside the kiln, so we want that chemistry to be as stable as possible. So we retrieve that, uh, that goes into a, um, this is other materials, our silica, iron and alumina being added into the system here. What we actually do is, is uh, run that through a, what's called a gamma metric system, which measures the chemistry of the material as it's going through on the conveyor belt. Again, to make the uh, chemistry as stable as possible. Then it goes into a raw mill, which is a, a roller mill. It drops down onto a spinning table. And we have rollers that press down on top of that material to grind it down into a fine powder. From there, it goes into a silo, it gets collected and goes into a silo. Again, it gets drawn out of the silo at different uh, points in the silo to even out the chemistry and then goes into the preheater tower, which is like a giant counter current heat exchanger. The whole idea of this is to heat material up and recover as much heat from the process as possible and, and make it useful in the rest of the process. From there it goes into the kiln, this is where it gets to its hottest point, it gets up to 1500 degrees Celsius here, and that actually melts the alumina and iron inside the kiln and forms a liquid phase in the kiln, and that's where we're forming this intermediate material called clinker. From there, it drops out into a cooler to cool it down again, because at this point we're somewhere around 1150 degrees Celsius uh, material temperature, so we need to cool that down, and again, that air is recovered and used back in the system to uh, improve the energy efficiency of the system. Gets crushed, uh, goes into intermediate storage, which is this building here. From there, it gets recovered and goes into a, the finished grinding uh, system, ground down into a fine powder again, and that is very, very quickly the overview of uh, the production of Portland Lone, Portland Cement. Okay, any questions? That's very, very quick on the entire manufacturing process for cement and history of cement and stuff like that. So any questions before we move on? Yes? In that video, do you capture CO2? No. Why would they not capture CO2 in the processing? Uh, historically, it's been very difficult to, to capture the CO2, so the stack gases out of a cement plant tend to be in the order of around uh, somewhere between 25 and 35% CO2 in the gas itself. 
but there's a lot of other gases that are in that gas stream, which makes it very challenging, very difficult to recover that CO2 from the gas stream. One of the first issues that you have with that gas stream is that it can, is still quite hot. Uh, even going through the entire process, stack gases are of the order of 120 degrees Celsius, which makes it challenging to recover the CO2 as well, but more on the CO2 recovery later. You say you recover some of the heat. What do you use the heat for? The heat is used to reduce the uh, or improve the energy efficiency of the of the manufacturing process itself. So it's recycled and reused back around within the process. Creating. Yeah. Any other questions before we move on? So we're going to look at uh, different cement solutions, uh, and this is really the meat of um, of the of the evening, where we're looking at different things that the cement industry and the ready mix industry, the concrete industry, is doing to reduce the carbon footprint of uh, cement and concrete. So the first thing to bear in mind is that one of the things that happens with all concrete is a process called carbonation. This is uh, a process that happens with, with concrete once it's in place. It starts absorbing CO2 back out of the atmosphere and incorporates that back into the concrete. Now, if you have a look at uh, ISO 21930, there's actually some information in there about the calculation methodologies that can be used for, uh, for module D, which is uh, where this belongs is in terms of measuring this for an LCA. And there are a bunch of different ways of measuring this, uh, different research that is still ongoing as to how to measure this and, and accurately calculate this. But depending on what systems you use for measuring this, uh, it's about a quarter of the total CO2 emissions, uh, between a quarter and a third of the total CO2 emissions from cement manufacturing get reincorporated back into the concrete once it's in place through this process called carbonation. How many years does this carbonation process take? A long time. Yeah. Now, there's a whole bunch of different factors that affect carbonation. There's things like the weather conditions, the atmospheric CO2 concentration, temperature, age, uh, surface area, because everything has to be absorbed through the surface of the concrete, surface treatments, all of those sorts of things affect how much CO2 is actually going to be absorbed back into the, uh, back into the concrete. So for each of the things, uh, each of these different solutions that, uh, that I'm going to be highlighting here, I've given them all a little um, meter here about you know, roughly how realistic and, and how useful this particular uh, process is. And I've given this a, a, a four out of six. This is a scale up to six. I've given this four out of six. So it's, it's good, but it's not great. Sorry, but the time scale you're saying, like how, like is it 100 years, more than 100 years, or like? Um, to like actually sequester that amount of For, it depends, it, it really does depend on, on course, particularly yeah. surface area. So if you have very, if you crush concrete, for example, yeah. you, that gets absorbed very quickly. If you're looking at, at large buildings, for example, with a low, small surface area, that could be in excess of 100 years. Wouldn't most of that though happen when it is demolished, or does it happen like this one? For yeah, when it's when it's demolished during that de demolition process, you're increasing the surface area of the concrete because through that demolition process, and that allows more surface area to be uh, to be uh, to absorb CO two, and yeah, that does have a significant jump in the carbonation at that point. And by the way, there's lots of time to have more discussion after this as well. So Portland Limestone Cement, um, this is the GUL that was on the third slide, I guess. Um, so what we do here is, the process is exactly the same, but at this point, rather than just adding gypsum, we add additional limestone at this point. So remember, all of the CO2 emissions are effectively, not all of them, but the vast majority of them, are in this part of the process, so the, the kiln part of the process, where we're heating the, uh, heating the materials and driving off the CO2. 
okay? So what we do with Portland limestone cement is add limestone at this point and the grinding point to reduce the amount of clinker, which is this material that's in the cement itself. So just as a description, so it's limestone added during the, uh, the cement grinding process, we add up to between five and 15% limestone. Standard GU cement or type one cement uh, for those that use ASTM standards, uh, that allows up to 5% limestone. GUL cement or type 1L cement allows up to 15% limestone. There are some limitations uh, to its use. Some speci specifiers aren't particularly uh, enamored with the idea of, uh, of having limestone in their cement. And uh, so there's some restrictions or some, some speci specifiers have some restrictions around its use. Uh, and some of those are restrictions around specific applications for the, for, for the concrete. So what are the side effects of adding limestone afterwards? So the way it's actually uh, produced in Canada is that the cement has what we call equivalent performance. So for a Radiomex producer, they should be able to swap out between GU cement or type 1 cement and GUL cement or type 1L cement without making significant changes to their, to their operations. The strength of the concrete? Strength of the concrete is, is the same. That, that equivalent performance was based on 28 day strength. Okay. So potential, what's the potential for CO2 reduction here? Between five and 10%, depending on the level of limestone that's actually uh, used in the cement. And as far as the status and viability goes, so each of these uh, four points, I'll be going through all of the different uh, other items here with, and highlighting these different four points. So it's currently available, widely used, um, particularly here in the Lower Mainland, both, uh, both really, uh, cement producers in the Lower Mainland produce a port of limestone cement. So I uh, have rated this five out of, out of six. So it's a pretty good solution. It's something that can be done today without really having much impact at all on construction or ready mix producers or anything like that. It's, it's a very simple swap out. Do you know when you first walk through the test stream, what point does it begin as a skid through the structural engineer and be like, this As far as structural engineers go, it's the same strength. It's like uh, different yeah. concrete types. And for Lafarge, for example, we can actually swap between these two cements and make no changes whatsoever to our mixed de designs for ready mix and still achieve the, the strength requirements as well. What are the limitations? There's some limitations, some like Ministry of Transportation here in BC, for example, they have some limitations around the use of this cement in sulfate conditions, and they don't want to use it in, in uh, precast concrete girders. They haven't actually explained why, but they're scared, they're afraid. It's new technology, it's, it's different, it's, it's, yeah, different is, and there's some fear around its use. So for building, uh, we started producing this in 2011, and it's been in use uh, here in the Lower Mainland since then. With some uh, some large buildings like uh, the Mark Building was actually the first building completed, uh, not completed, but the first building that actually used this in the Vancouver area. So it's still standing. We're not expecting it to fall down anytime soon. <laughs> Okay, uh, something else that we do on the, uh, uh, in terms of cement manufacturing is we use things, so the primary fuels that are used for cement manufacturing are things like coal uh, and natural gas. So one of the things that the cement industry is, has done and have been doing for a number of years now is actually use things other than those virgin fuels. So we use uh, what we call alternate fuels. And these may be from from urban mining, they may be construction, demolition waste, for example. Um, there's uh, pelletized sewage sludge has been used. Uh, in Europe, they use a lot of uh, what we call uh, in the industry MBM, which is meat and bone meal, so basically ground up animals. 
Um, which was which was actually uh, it was actually it was actually great during the uh, the mad cow crisis in the UK. So, um, so pelletized sewage sludge is used. Um, wood any any wood fibers, uh, those sorts of things. Um, almost almost anything that will burn uh, has been used as a fuel for cement manufacturing. <laughs> <laughs> almost anything. <laughs> Um, limitations, it only addresses the, uh, the, the fuel that is actually used in, uh, um, in the manufacturing process. Some of those fuels need to be assumed to be carbon neutral to, to really be beneficial. So when you're looking at an LCA, if you're going to assume that none of those alternate fuels are going to be considered carbon neutral, then you need to incorporate that uh, carbon in those LCA calculations. And that's why, as far as the potential goes, it's somewhere between zero and 40% reduction. Is that of the, only of the fuel, of the one third? No, of the total. Okay. So that's why it's, it's a maximum of 40%. So it's about 60% of the CO2 emissions from cement manufacturing are from that decarbonation process. The rest is from and it fuel that's used for uh, heating everything up. So that's one third of the total, yeah. though, right? Yeah. And it's 40% of a third. 40% of the total. So there are, pl there are manufacturing the plants world. 40% of 33%. Like with 33%, how can you reduce it by 40% of the total? Uh, that's a different slide and with different numbers. And the, the actual use of fuel accounts for somewhere between 30 and 45 or maybe even as much as 50% of the CO2 emissions depending on what the process is for the manufacturing. Okay. Yes. Why can't you electrify? Nobody's done it yet, although there is some research that's being done on that now to actually create these, uh, these um, uh, they're actually creating uh, calcium silicates through an electrochemical process, but it's bench top at the moment being done at MIT, it's in its infancy as far as being able to do this. Uh, very I have no idea how much it's going to cost if that ever makes it to reality. So status and viability, this is something that is done in the industry now. It's been done in the industry for a number of years. Uh, it's just a case of capitalizing on that and running through the LCA calculations to figure out for different fuels what the actual savings are. So again, four out of six, roughly, it's not, because we're only addressing the fuel consumption, it's not great, but it's pretty good. And it's available now, yes. Is your cement plant in Richmond 100% biofuels now? No, um, there are, there are a few plants worldwide that do use 100% alternate fuels, they're not using any virgin fuels at all. There aren't very many of them. Uh, the cement plant here, uh, the hard plant here in Richmond, um, the target for, uh, for the 2020 year is to be somewhere around 50 to 55 percent use of alternate fuels. Uh, there's recently been a major investment to increase the use of alternate fuels and that system has at times allowed the, uh, allowed the plant to get up to somewhere around 70 percent alternate fuel use. One of the other things uh, and issues with alternate fuel use is what fuels are available locally, how you get them to the plant, how, are they actually viable fuels. For Metro Vancouver, we have to run through a whole bunch of emission scenarios, make sure that we're, our emissions aren't going to change and be adversely affected and all of that sort of stuff as well. Another solu uh, solution here is pond biofuels. Uh, this is from PondTech. Um, Basically what they're doing with this process is recovering a small amount of the stack gases uh, that come out of the cement plant and running it through these bioreactors um, and they have algae grown in these bioreactors and the, the particular strain of algae that they've chosen for this uh, grows better under this <coughs> nice pink light which is why the, uh, the bioreactors are pink. Um, 
So it is a uh, limitations here. It is a relatively small volume of gas that is uh, recovered at the moment. Um, this is still in a pilot phase and it's been in, uh, in production now for quite a few years, but still just in its pilot phase. Uh, it's, it is a biological process, so it is actually quite slow, but that algae, once it's uh, got, once it's filled the bioreactor, the algae is actually recovered and can be used for production of biofuel or can be used uh, directly as a fuel itself as well. So potential reduction depends on the number of reactors. Uh, and as I said, it's, uh, it's still in pilot phase at one plant uh, here in Canada, uh, but they are looking for additional plants for, uh, for rollout and use. Would that uh, algae be considered carbon neutral then? Because I'm thinking that the carbon will be released eventually, but maybe because it's double used then it's not counted anymore. Anthony, as an LCA practitioner, <laughs> pass. <laughs> <laughs> I've looked at it before, and it was the, the algae part is, is neutral because it's bio, but the light, that, the energy that goes into the LEDs is actually significant, so you have to count that. Good info. <laughs> this is why this is probably going to be a discussion, and there's going to be a lot of interesting tidbits of information that I had absolutely no idea about as well. Um, 15 or 20 minutes? Okay. Yep, yep. That'll work. So, um, rate this at a, at a three. So, good, but not, not great. It has some potential there. Now, some people in the industry would have heard about this uh, material called geopolymers. This is basically cement-like materials that don't have cement in them. So, some of these can be considered carbon neutral, depending on what the material is. Um, they use a chemical activator to make them go hard, so they, they kind of work kind of like cement, but they're not cement. Um, their, their availability it depends on what raw materials are available. They're not viable for all applications. They're not accepted in codes and standards, so the use is somewhat sketchy in some cases. Um, depending on what the material is, it could be a 100% reduction in comparison to CO2 emissions from, from cement manufacturing, but it's really ongoing research at this point, and uh, there have been attempts to make this commercially viable, um, but most of those companies have uh, wound up in one way or another. It, does this affect the strength of the, the concrete? Yes. So depending on what the material is, what the binder is, and all of that sort of stuff, some, you may not be able to use it for high strength concrete, for example. It may have some very limited applications. What kind of application would something like this, like a concrete that has holes in it? Uh, it's been used in paving stone manufacturing and things like that. Uh, nothing structural for the most part. Some roads, sidewalks, so on and so forth. So I rate this at a, at a three, again, uh, not entirely suitable for how we use cement uh, today. Another one people may have heard of is Solidia. Uh, this is a cement-like material, uh, but actually uses CO2 for, uh, for, for going hard. So it actually uh, cures under a CO2 atmosphere. So the, uh, the, the idea here is that it uses the similar materials to cement manufacturing, but in a different way, uh, and needs a CO2 atmosphere to, to cure and go hard. But once that, is, uh, once that, that process is finished, it's done. The material is fully reacted <coughs> and you can use it not like concrete where you're waiting for strength to develop, okay? Typically used in precast elements only because you need that enclosed atmosphere to soak the element in CO2. Currently not accepted in codes and standards, so again, it can be used in things like uh, non-structural things like paving stones and things like that. It's typically where it's been used so far. Potential is up to 70% reduction in comparison to cement. Um, and as far as its status and viability, there is ongoing research at this point looking for and seeking commercial commercialization. Mm. So you need to capture CO2 in order to... Yes, you need a CO2 source. Yeah. So because of some of those issues, 
only rate this at a, at a two has great potential so i would expect this to be going up and improving but there's a long way to go what's the path for close to standards like is it is that a long road or yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it depends in different countries some Different countries have different mechanisms to use innovative product products and processes in codes and standards. Uh, Canada is not one of them. <laughs> okay, carbon capture. This is uh, a uh, very early days as far as a, a, a pilot process goes. Uh, and this is actually going to be pilot. This is a, uh, a company that's set up here in Burnaby. Um, and they're going to be piloting the system at Richmond, at the cement plant in Richmond, the Lafarge plant in Richmond. Basically what they're doing is a temperature swing absorption, uh, separation of CO2 from the gas stream. So it has three, uh, three um, ducts here, uh, and this interior piece here rotates around. You take the uh, stack gases through one of these ducts, it scrubs out the CO2 which is absorbed into a, uh, a, uh, onto plates in the spinning disc, spins around into the next chamber, that CO2 is scrubbed off those chambers to get a CO2 rich gas, and then goes through conditioning to be, go back around the entire process again. Now this process happens in 60 seconds in comparison to pressure swing absorption systems which can take an hour or more. So uh, what they've done here is actually speed the whole process up quite a lot. And the idea is that they'll be able to recover a lot more CO2 because it's a lot faster as far as the process. Currently in research, uh, the plant <coughs> hasn't been set up yet. Um, there is a need for figuring out what to do with that concentrated CO2 stream, which I'll come on to later. Um, exactly how much they're going to be able to recover, no idea because they're not that far along yet. Uh, and as I said, as far as status and viability goes, it's still in research. So rated this at a two out of six. So again, great potential for, uh, for moving that needle up, but there's a long way to go here yet. Okay, so those, yes. Cement is what maybe 15, 20% of concrete. How much CO2 do we produce to mine gravel, crush it, handle it, operate cement mixers? Where, where are we? So if we cut down CO2 in cement in half, right? How much would that overall? So as far as, yeah, so as far as the CO2 impact goes, um, cement by weight, cement accounts for somewhere between, depending on the mix design, somewhere between about nine and 12 or 13% of the mass of concrete, but it accounts for 80% of the, of the CO2 emitted, or the embodied CO2 for concrete. So yes, there is CO2 uh, embodied in the extraction of, of uh, aggregates, for example, water, transportation, all of that sort of stuff, but it's, it's the cement that's the big player as far as the CO2 emissions go for, uh, for the embodied CO2 in concrete. So onto concrete solutions, um, some, hopefully everyone is familiar with this one. Fly ash is what's called an SCM, a supplementary cementitious material. It's like cement, does cement type things, um, has some limitations. It's a, as far as what it is, it's a byproduct from coal-fired power generation. Has limitations as far as its use. Typically it would max out at about 50% uh, replacement rate for cement. Um, but most would max out at about 30%. It's not accepted in all specifications. Can have some implications as far as uh, project schedule, finishability, placeability, things like that. So those things you need to be aware of if you're doing this. And unfortunately, um, the coal-fired power plants are being shut down. So <laughs> lifespan for this, kind of a bit limited. Depending on replacement level, somewhere between 10 and 20% CO2 reduction on concrete, on a concrete basis. There is a long-term history for use, but as I said, uh, these power plants are being shut down, so how viable it is long-term. Has anyone looked at, like, because like China also has lots of coal power plants, and they have a ton of fly ash as well, but like, is there any market for import of fly ash? Uh, potentially. 
Doesn't that de defeat the purpose of decarbonization? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, you start running into carbon leakage issues. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Is it just a byproduct of coal-powered power generation or any burning of coal, like for example, steel making? We'll get on to steel making next. <laughs> so I've rated this six because this is an existing system. It's been in use for years. People are familiar with it. They know exactly what to do with this. Um, it just needs for some specifiers to make sure that they're specifying as much uh, fly ash as actually practical. Slag, this is uh, from iron manufacturing. Um, so it's a byproduct of iron manufacturing. It's a, it's a waste material for iron manufacturing, but it's not waste if you don't waste it. So it's used in the cement and concrete production. Much higher replacement levels, uh, typically around 80%, uh, maximum around 80%, but typically used around 50%. Again, can have strength implications, finishability implications, project schedules and things like that. Not accepted in all specifications, but has the potential for reducing the CO2 for embodied carbon for concrete by between 20 and 30%, depending on how much you use. Again, long-term history of use, so I rate this at a, at a six. So something that can be done today, not really a lot of thought involved in, in doing this. Ground glass, this is relatively new. So it's recycled glass, pulverized and ground down into a fine powder. Relatively recent, uh, so the, so far the maximum that's been tested with this material is 40%, so typically in the 20 to 30% sort of range. You've got to be aware of how consistent the material is. Again, not accepted in all specification standards and codes. Um, potential hasn't really been studied on an LCA perspective, uh, but probably somewhere in the order of 10 to 20% reduction. Currently available in some uh, some locations, rate this relatively low because its availability is so limited. Other types of SCM, so there's all sorts of other things that you may add to your concrete to reduce the embodied carbon. You could add silica fume, uh, which is used for producing high performance concrete. It's used commonly in bridge decks, for example, to reduce the permeability of the concrete. There are natural pozzolans, think natural pozzolans, think of the Romans and the stuff that they did, that's what, that's what natural pozzolans are. And there's also recovered fly ash. So although the um, coal-fired power generation plants are shutting down, a lot of them, particularly in the US, they've done things like ponded waste material in, in uh, detention ponds or they've landfilled that material. Sometimes that material can be recovered and, uh, and used in concrete as well. Limitations to, to using these materials is familiarity with the, these are new materials. People may not know what they are or how to use them, what their maximum replacement rates are, all of that sort of stuff. Potential depends on what the material is. Um, and as far as status and viability goes, there's new materials being identified all the time. Exactly how viable those materials are may be um, location dependent. So again, I've rated this one relatively low at, uh, at two. Carbon Cure. Some people would have heard about Carbon Cure. Basically what this system is, is injecting CO2 uh, into the uh, manufacturing process for, uh, for concrete. So it's injected into, if you're looking at um, ready mix concrete, it's actually injected directly into the truck as soon as the concrete is batched with a wand in the back of the truck. There is additional equipment required, um, but uh, that it's no, there's no financial uh, outlay for that as part of a licensing agreement with, uh, with Carbon Cure. And we have some people here that at the back here that would be able to fill you in on all the details of exactly how this whole thing works uh, from a financial perspective. The potential savings as far as the CO2 reductions depends on where your, what your starting point is. Okay, somewhere between a one and 5% reduction in CO2. Um, but if you've got more potential for, uh, for CO2 reductions, uh, right from the get go, you're obviously going to achieve more out of this by doing this. It is commercially available and it is increasing in use throughout uh, worldwide and, and certainly here in Canada. 
And as far as uh, as far as that CO, using that CO two from that CO two recovery system from the cement manufacturing process, this is one of those outlets for that CO two. So I rate this pretty good, four out of six, uh, and certainly has the potential to increase. Final part here, uh, as far as embodied carbon, so moving away from looking at, at materials and manufacturing processes, there are other ways to reduce embodied carbon in the built environment as well. And one of them is, is switching from prescriptive and moving to performance-based specifications. And this was actually raised at, at the last uh, ECN, and, and the question was, well, what is a performance specification? What does it look like? So as far as the prescriptive elements of a prescriptive specification, it tends to be strength-based. It's a defined water cement, cement materials ratio, and that's what that WCM stands for. So this is the amount of water to the amount of binder, which is a governing law about basically how hard or what strength you're going to achieve out of your concrete. So the more water you have in your concrete, the lower the strength for the same amount of materials that you've got going in there. There tends to be limits on the type of cements that can be used, and there may be minimum cement, cementitious contents, for example. That's relatively common. Limits on SCM, so that's supplementary cementitious materials. There may be limits on their type and the amount that you can use. Limits on admixtures and additives. And overall, the primary risk with these types of specifications lies with the owner or, and the designer. It builds on the history of construction and the empirical relationships with that everyone knows and has have been in use from a structural perspective for well, basically since 1889 where we started building with, with uh, reinforced concrete. Doesn't really permit a lot of creativity or innovation. So if we switch over to performance, they tend to be, these specifications are flexible we look at functional uh, performance criteria of a particular element or structure or building, whatever it is that is being looked at. What is it that the building actually needs to do, for example? Looks at plastic and hardened requirements. There's other measurable things that you can throw in there as well. And the primary risk in this case really lies with the contractor and the producer of the, uh, of the cement, uh, of the concrete, sorry but it does allow a lot of flexibility to achieve the design requirements for the particular project. So as far as, uh, I'm gonna split this up into three different uh, sections. So we have plastic concrete, which is the concrete when it's in its wet state, it's in a mixer truck being delivered to site. So there's things that you can actually measure in, in, uh, in, in the concrete at that point. And these are some of the things that you may be interested in and including in the performance specification. So there's all sorts of things around the plastic properties of, uh, of concrete. From there, we go into transition concrete. So this is when the concrete is starting to go hard. Again, there are different things that you may be interested in, in looking at here. So volume changes, rate of strength gain, set times, the temperature of the, of the concrete are important, how workable the concrete is, that's important as well from a transition uh, perspective. And then we get into the hardened concrete and you've got the obvious ones like strength and all the different ways to measure strength. There's uh, conductivity, volume changes, creep, permeability. And then the big one at the end here is of course you can include an embodied carbon requirement for your concrete. How much of, sorry, I have a question on the performance back. So if you, if you have here whatever 30 criteria or whatever it is, right? So for your different concrete mixes, how many of these could you reliably, do you have test results on and could actually prove that? <laughs> so why don't we see more performance specifications? <laughs> <laughs> So part of it is understanding the difference between prescriptive and performance specifications. Performance specifications, as Katrina has pointed out, you need to have some history around the particular mix, how it performs, and how you're actually going to measure that performance. Anything that you have in the performance specifications needs to be measured in some way or another. Otherwise, it's just qualitative. It's like you suck your thumb and is it doing what it should? Nah. I don't agree, if you, if you are using performance specifications 
and you don't have everything defi well defined as far as how you're going to measure performance, then you get into one party arguing against another party is saying it's not doing what it's supposed to do because it wasn't defined properly in the first place. So measuring concrete and how to measure the performance of concrete is a key part of that. And all of those things that were on the slides before, some of them have very, very good ways of measuring those things. Others are a bit flaky and maybe not so great. And some of them are even qualitative uh, measures. You need to have a quality control and assurance system in place right through the entire supply chain. You need to have the data on the historical performance to say that this is a mixed design that's actually going to be delivered here and yes it does what it's supposed to do and meets the requirements that you have here. You need to have those clear specifications as, a, as I pointed out. Uh, more commonly you see hybrid specifications which is a combination of both uh, both performance and prescriptive elements and if you want more information about performance um, specifications there's some different uh, light reading documents that you can have a look at <laughs> so any questions uh, or do you want to have a break now and then we can uh, come back and have a Question, yeah, let's, uh, so we have about a half an hour left in the event, so maybe we just take a quick five minute break and then we'll, we'll reconvene and we'll just get into a discussion slash questions. Sound good? Sure. Right. That was great. Yeah, let's give it a yeah, that was awesome.